the, the label liberalism covers a multitude of things and a multitude of sins, and not all of which are liberal. I have only to mention the name Vladimir Zhidanovsky um, to make that point. Indeed, th things described as liberal range from what are virtually communists in California to what are close to fascists in Siberia and everything in between. Uh, even the, the range of things which could plausibly be called liberalism is quite wide. I would commend to you, if you're interested in this, a publication we did at Oxford called Liberalisms in East and West, where my colleague Michael Frieden lays out all the different clusters of what might be called liberalism, right? So there's a question about that. N nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that some version of liberalism or, or something calling itself liberalism has been hegemonic in the Gramscian sense, that's to say dominating the ideological discourse, certainly in the West, but to some extent even in the world, for roughly 20 years after the end of the Cold War, give or take. Um, and um, therefore, we who self-describe as liberals with a small L, and I'm certainly a liberal, have to ask ourselves this question, what went wrong? Now, the first answer to that is it's not in necessarily anything that went wrong. It may be something that went right. That is to say, I think it's entirely plausible to argue that Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi and Recep Tayyip Erdogan are to some extent reacting against, responding to the extraordinary spread of liberalism. So that what they are doing, and I think in the case of Putin and Xi Jinping, quite consciously, is a reaction to the spread of liberalism. If you look at the famous document number nine of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, which specifies the so-called seven don't mention, things that may not be mentioned in the Chinese media, liberalism, constitutionalism, Western liberal values are high on the list. So we face an anti-liberal counter-revolution, which is in significant measure actually a backhanded tribute to the success of liberalism and the spread of liberalism. Moreover, it's only natural. Any historian would expect that after a wave, mm -hmm. there comes a counter-wave. After the Reformation, there comes the Counter-Reformation. After the Revolution, there comes the Counter-Revolution. So a historian would be amazed if there was not a counter-wave after such a rather dramatic spread of one ideology or clusters of related ideologies. Um, Poland has a remarkable phenomenon of a youth, educated youth, which is quite strongly anti-liberal and Eurosceptic. And that's very strange for people in Western Europe because they look at it and say the young are meant to be pro-European and liberal. But actually, it's easy to understand because what you've had in Poland for 25 years since 1989 is an absolute domination of liberal pro-European discourse. To be young is to kick against the pricks. The pricks are liberal, so you kick against liberalism. Right, so there's a perfect logic to it. Nonetheless, that should not absolve us from asking what actually went wrong with liberalism as opposed to what went right. And um, my, my patron saint in this respect is George Orwell, and George Orwell famously said, you should always be toughest on your own side. So I'm going to be toughest on my own side. And what I'm talking about is mainly what's happened in countries which either are still liberal democracies or at some point have been close to liberal democracy. So I'm not talking about, say, China, uh, countries which, which are clearly, and I'm not talking about Russia mainly. Um, I am talking about Eastern Europe and the rest of the wider West. Okay, so, and I'm talking mainly about domestic affairs more than foreign policy. Okay, so here we go. What went wrong with liberalism? 
The first and most obvious critique was that we had a one-dimensional version of liberalism. Liberalism has economic, social, cultural, and political dimensions, and what we got was overwhelmingly the economic dimension of liberalism, but not necessarily as strongly the other dimensions. Moreover, within the economic liberalism, what we got was a particular version. Neoliberalism is the familiar shorthand. Uh, if you read the work of Danny Roderick, the Harvard economist, you'll see that it's a problematic shorthand, but let's use it for want of a better one. And it's characterized not only by an enormous privileging of free market solutions, often unregulated or underregulated, but by two features, globalization and financialization of capitalism, globalization and financialization. That is to say, a version of capitalism in which financial instruments, derivatives, the whole financial system, plays a disproportionate role worldwide. And I think it's reasonable to say, to recall the terms of Comrade Karl Marx, that globalization in its financialized form its globalized financialization and financialized globalization has been on the whole much better for capital than for labor, particularly in the West. It's been rather good for labor in China and rather good for labor in India, but in the West it's been much better for capital than for labor, partly for obvious reasons, because there's a massive increase in the supply of labor so the price of labor goes down. You can get the job done for a quarter of the price in India. So for the worker in the north of England, that's not great. The price of capital does not go down to the same degree. It's been good for capital, it's been good for capitalists. At the same time, this particular model of financialized globalization brought the world capitalist system to the financial crisis that begins in 2008, and Martin Wolf, the distinguished economics commentator of the Financial Times, argues that the financial crisis, specifically, was as big as that of the 1930s, beginning in 1929. So his argument is the knock-on effects were nothing like as great because measures were taken, lessons were learned, so the economic crisis was not as big, but the specific crisis of the financial system. And as we know, the bankers walked away essentially scot-free. Profits had been entirely privatized, and what profits they were, losses were socialized. We, the taxpayers, picked up the losses. Um, that created a lot of understandable resentment, resentment along with extraordinary levels of inequality, not seen for nearly a hundred years, and a strong sense of injustice and a sense of impunity on the part of capitalists in general and bankers in particular. Um, just a little illustration. Some of you may remember that the Obama administration tried to reform what's called the carried interest provision in American tax law, which is one of the ways in which you know, hedge fund investors and bankers keep an awful lot of their accumulated capital. Stephen Schwarzman, who's one of the richest men in America, said, I quote, it's a war, this war against this uh, reform. It's like when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939. Interesting comparison. Nice sense of proportion, I think. Uh, in Davos, where we're meeting here in our own forum, the World Economic Forum is meeting in Davos. I heard yesterday Lloyd Bankfein of the uh, Goldman Sachs say that, you know, globalization is very good for everybody, but Trump has a point about the distribution side, that maybe the distribution wasn't quite so great. Now, exactly what Goldman Sachs did about redistribution is not entirely clear to me, but, but at, least, <laughs> at least that is being said. Um, another small illustration of this, I can confidently say that I paid more tax 
than Facebook in Britain in 2014. Anyone like to guess how much tax Facebook paid in Britain in 2014? Anyone want to guess? Have a go. Go on. Nothing? Uh, you're, you're, so, you're so Russian in your approach to this thing. <laughs> £4,327, with the entire tax paid by the whole of Facebook in the UK. <coughs> That's also something feel very angry about. Going slightly broader, I think the larger point is that liberalism, which was a campaigning creed, a creed critical of established power, became the establishment. It became the ideology of the elites, the ideology of privilege, of the privileged. Um, Michael Ignatiev wonderfully said that liberal moderation is the natural mating call of elite cosmopolitans. The mating call of elite cosmopolitans. So it became a doctrine of the elites and it brought with it a, a kind of a, a, a problem in the relationship between liberalism and democracy. So we like to think liberal democracy, the two naturally go together. Arguably, the elites in this period, the liberal elites, were very keen on the liberal part, but not always so keen on the democracy while populists are very keen on the democracy, but not so keen on the liberalism. And I think this is an absolutely key point. Um, the elites and the attitude to democracy. Uh, Edward Luce of the Financial Times in his book on, on Western liberalism quotes a, a Wall Street banker saying that he's so disgusted by the way the American people have voted he thinks there should be a general knowledge test before people are allowed to vote. They might, you know, ancient Athens might have been quite keen on that, but it's not quite what we mean by modern egalitarian uh, democracy. In Eastern Europe, in Poland, which I know well, there was, in the liberal elites, my friends, the post-solidarity liberal elites, a genuine fear of the masses and what they were going to do, do next. Now, that has to be acknowledged. Uh, and this came in the Polish case with the old Schlachter, the gentry tradition. You know, in Poland, the Schlachter, the gentry became the intelligentsia of a certain contempt for the peasants, the whoppy. Um, uh, in Western Europe, in Brexit Britain, you find something familiar. Some liberal metropolitan Remainers, people who wanted Britain to remain in the EU, if you hear them talk about Brexit voters in the north of England, it's rather like a Polish nobleman talking about his peasants. There's a real complaint there. And in the case of the European Union specifically, I certainly think one can detect elements of what I would call undemocratic liberalism. So it's clearly liberalism, but People have to be persuaded of the wisdom of these elite ideas, and if you vote the wrong way in a referendum, then vote again. On the populist side, Cass Müller, the, the, the expert on populism, argues that populism can be described as an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. Now, maybe that goes too far, but there's a grain of truth in that. Viktor Orban in Hungary, explicitly welcomed Trump's victory in the United States, saying this shows you can have non-liberal democracy. So he explicitly embraces non-liberal democracy. Now, I think it's important to say that this, this bifurcation in which liberalism becomes the property of the elites, the establishment and the privileged, and democracy becomes a slogan of the other half, is not just about economic inequality. It's often reduced to economic inequality, but they're much more important than that. And a good illustration of this, 
is Germany. How, if populism is about economics, how is it that one in eight German voters and the last German voters voted for a right-wing nationalist populist party, the Alternative für Deutschland? It can't just be economics. Moreover, four out of five of Alternative für Deutschland voters uh, say in, in the polling that they assess their personal economic situation as good or very good. So what's it about if it's not about economics in that case? I think it's about culture in the broadest sense. There is not just the inequality that is measured by the Gini coefficient, income inequality. There's what I call inequality of attention or inequality of respect, that certain parts of a society just are not paid any attention to, respected. They are disrespected. Um, a, a wonderful little illustration of this resentment was when Chancellor Angela Merkel visited a little town called Heidenau in Saxony, which is a very strongly RFD supporting part of Germany. And there was a, a the populace had a demonstration and Chancellor Merkel completely ignored them. She didn't even, she didn't even look at them. And one of the demonstrators told a reporter from Der Spiegel, sie schaut uns nicht einmal mit dem Arsch an. Which means she doesn't look at us even with her ass. Slightly Lutheran language, but absolutely makes a point. And that's exactly, and many a Trump voter or Brexit voter could have said exactly that about London bankers and Guardian columnists and Oxford professors and all those liberal elites. They don't even look at us with their arth. We did not, and not to mention Hillary Clinton, who famously, of course, had the phrase, basket of deplorables. Very well chosen phrase, may have lost her the election. So we did not deliver on the egalitarian liberal promise which is summarized by Ronald Dworkin, the great liberal philosopher, as equal respect and concern for each member of a given society. Equal respect and concern. We didn't deliver on that at all. If you look at the populist votes, two key determinants are education and geography. The, the best predictor of which way you would vote in the Brexit referendum was had you been to university or not, right? Been to university, vote Remain, not vote Brexit. Those who didn't go to university voted against those who had. And geography, in almost every case, there are certain regions of the country, what Julia Ilyes, the Hungarian writer, called the people of the Pusta in Hungary, rural Hungary from which Viktor Orban comes, uh, Polska Bay, as it's called in Poland, the rural east and southeast, the small towns, um, the uh, post-industrial towns of northern England, the Rust Belt. And when I talk about the inequality of attention, you know, how many articles did you read in the New York Times written with real sympathy and understanding about the life of the white working class in the Rust Belt? until Trump was elected. Not many. How many articles did you read in The Guardian about the post-industrial towns of northern England, written with real understanding and sympathy? Not many. Le Monde, Gazeta de Boccia, La Repubblica, El Pais, same story. Guilty as charged, liberal journalists as well, for the inequality of attention. Um, adding to this picture and nuancing it somewhat, Another element in this great divide is, as Mark Liller, the American political philosopher, argues in his recent book, identity politics. So liberals uh, embraced identity politics. Liller points out that if you go on the website of the Democratic Party in the United States, it has a, a, a drop-down menu where it says people. 
and you click on people, and you have 17 different groups that you can choose from. So there's no longer one people, the, 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 the United States. There are these individual peoples. None of those categories is white working class. Uh, and so what you saw on the Brexit vote, what you saw on the Trump vote, is also a reaction against those kind of identity politics. It's a reaction to what people call political correctness, the sense that there are an awful lot of things that an awful lot of ordinary people think, but you can no longer say. Around last year, there was a poll conducted in Germany by the Allensbach Institute, and people were asked, do you, do you feel that one can freely express one's political opinion in Germany today? Can you freely express your political opinion? Only 57% said yes. Think of that, 57%. So nearly half those asked didn't think they could freely express their opinion. And then the Trump or the Nigel Farage comes along and everyone says, hooray, so was, uh, endlich sagt das einer. At last someone is saying it. Uh, um, and, and, and so that added also to the, to the sense of these elites with their technocratic, rationalist, politically correct language not allowing us even to say what we think. Um, a familiar old argument against liberalism is that it's cold, remote, rationalist, and individualist that it neglects the bonds of community and indeed in the views of right-wing populists wants to dissolve the bonds of community, of family, of church, and of nation. Um, uh, cultural and social liberalism played into that narrative. And then, of course, not so much in Eastern Europe, but in Western Europe, the twin phenomena of freedom of movement inside the European Union and mass migration from outside the European Union. Um, openness to which was clearly a liberal position. I mean, there's no question about it. This was indeed, Tony Blair explicitly made the opening of the, of the British labor market to anyone from the accession states of the EU as a liberal commitment. In a recent Bertelsmann survey, um, people across the EU were put, asked to to, to comment on the following statement. There are so many foreigners in our country, sometimes I feel like a stranger. That was a statement. Agree or disagree? Guess what the average was across the EU? Anyone like to guess? Well, it's, it's a wonderful figure. Exactly 50-50. Exactly 50-50. 50 percent of those asked said, there are so many foreigners in our country, sometimes I feel like a stranger. More than 50% in Germany, 71% in Italy. And this goes again to the 50-50, the one half, the other half story that I'm trying to tell. Um, now, I think it's really important to say that this is by no means all, or even in main part, about racism or xenophobia. A lot of it is about the sheer speed and scale of change. So just up the road from here, I went canvassing for people to vote to remain in the EU in the Brexit referendum in, in June 2016. East Oxford, the area around you, I don't know if you had a chance to go wandering beyond the beautiful village, uh, has a large immigrant population. And my conversations mainly consisted of Asian British shopkeepers and residents of East Oxford complaining about the bloody Poles and East Europeans who were taking the jobs and the housing and filling up the schools and making long queues in hospitals. It's a, by the way, it's a wonderful backhanded tribute to uh, the integration of Muslims in Britain, so that the British version of xenophobia was Asian Muslim Brits complaining about white Christian Europeans. <laughs> but it was all about that. 
this was the decisive factor in the Brexit vote. There's absolutely no question about it. And it wasn't racism in their case, because many of these people knew about racism because they had experienced it. It was just, this is all going far too far and far too fast. Freud had a wonderful phrase about being people living beyond their psychological means. Isn't that a great phrase? Living beyond their psychological means. And we were, we liberals, we globalizers, were asking people to live beyond their psychological means. It was too much. And then a colon comes Marine Le Pen. What was the slogan of the Front National? On est chez nous. We're among our own. We're among ourselves. We're at home. In short, if I had to summarize my argument in a single se sentence, it would have to be that we liberals neglected the other half of our own societies. Not the other half of the world, by the way, because actually what we did, liberal globalization, was rather good for my, the other half of the world, but the other half of our own societies. And it came back to bite us. OK, the last few minutes before I open this up, what is to be done, as Comrade Leonard famously asked? What can we do about it? Now, I'm assuming we embraces most people in this room who are, in some sense, small L liberals. Um, please say so if you come from another point of view, but may I make that assumption, at least for the moment. So, just a few thoughts, and then I, I'd love to get into a conversation with you. We have to fight. But the liberal fighters have to be self-critical fighters because it is of the essence of liberalism to be constantly self-criticizing, self-interrogating. That is what distinguishes liberalism from other creeds, right? It's quite difficult. Most crack troops are not made up of fantastically self-critical people and particularly not in the moment they charge into battle. Um, but we actually, that's what we have to do. We have to do both things at once. We have to be self-critical fighters. So I've given you the criticism. Now let me give you some of the fight, which, of course, the strategy of which follows from having made the correct analysis of the problem. Uh, first, make your diagnosis, then your prescription. So what we shouldn't do is in any way, shape, or form to relativize or downgrade our own basic liberal values. That is definitely a temptation in this situation. Mark Leonard of the European Council on Foreign Relations, who famously 13 years ago wrote a book called Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, uh, now has written an article saying that maybe Europe should go from universalism to exceptionalism, right? So now we should think of Europe as an exceptional space and not think, about, think of it as something which could be universalized. I profoundly disagree. I, you had a session with the Skidelskis on yes. universalism, yes. I think. He talked about history and economy. Right. While waiting for your metaphysics. Um, I'm not sure about the metaphysics, but what I would yes. say is this. The version of universalism that I would defend is, to use a slightly jargony phrase, normative universalism. Mm -hmm. It's not anthropological universalism, because liberal values are not an anthropological universal. It's not the political universalism, which one often heard from the United States, which suggested that, so to speak, the natural condition of human beings is liberal democracy. And it's somehow a weird aberration when they go for anything else. It is a normative universalism. That is to say, it says, here are our values, our principles, and we believe that if everyone lived by these values, everyone would be better off. That's the proposition we put on the table. That's what I've tried to do in my recent book on free speech, 10 Principles for a Connected World. It's important to go on speaking out for these values, first of all, because one should stand up for what one believes in, even if it's a hopeless case. But secondly, because there are people like you. In connection with my book, I've been in 20 countries in the last 18 months. Turkey, Egypt, China, India, all over Eastern Europe, you name it. In every single country, free speech is being pushed back. 
has been eroded, often dramatically, as in the case of Turkey. But in every single case, there are dissidents, there are journalists, there are academics, there are think tankers, there are students, there are young people who are fighting to, to, to defend these values. And simply to keep face with you and with them, we have to keep speaking up for these values. Although I have to say, I felt at the end of this 18 months, traveling around the world talking about free speech, as if I was in Eastern Europe in the early 1970s, not even the late 1970s, before Helsinki, before Charter 77, before Solidarność, where you had oppressive regimes and relatively small groups of dissidents uh, and a lot of private dissent. And in a way, in many of these countries, we're almost back to that position where it's about fostering a long process of social change from below in civil society, rather than expecting any short-term favorable reform from above. Does that sound familiar to some of you? Maybe it does. We have, of course, to be realistic. We are in the defensive. So something else I think we have to be more realistic about is humanitarian interventionism, military interventionism. Clearly in the sort of almost the hubris of liberal internationalism. We did Iraq, um, we went far too far in liberal interventionism. What I don't think we should give up on is R2P, the so-called responsibility to protect in its original form, that is to say, in intervening, including with armed force, if there is a genuine danger of genocide or crimes against humanity, but certainly more liberal realism. In our own societies, and actually in many ways the best thing we can do for you in Russia, or indeed as it might be in China, is to make our own societies strong, vibrant, open and prosperous. I would argue in the Cold War that was the most important single thing the West did. It wasn't Reagan and it wasn't the peace movement, it wasn't uh, um, Willy Brandt and detente policy, those were secondary factors. The most important factor was what Conrad Adner called Magnet Europa, the European magnet, and so that I think is what we have to do. We have to make our own societies you know, vibrant and magnetic again. This means making liberalism three-dimensional again, not just one-dimensional. It means having a much more nuanced and carefully considered form of globalization, not unlimited capital liberalization, not unlimited uh, service liberalization. It means addressing the problem of inequality not just in the narrow sense of income inequality, i.e. changing taxes, but in terms of accumulated capital and wealth, in terms of the inequality of attention, so culturally, socially, in the media, in terms of what we do about big global multinational com companies like Facebook. The economy was global, the governance was national. They got away in between. Um, and because what we are now getting on top of all the problems we have now is the impact of the digital revolution, artificial intelligence, which quite likely, at least in the short term, is going to take a lot more jobs. I think we as liberals have to think about some of the ideas that have been floating around in the sort of social liberal debate for decades, such as the idea of a universal basic income. If there's not going to be enough work to go around, what do we do about those people who don't have work? This is an idea Ralph Darned or floated as early as 1988, but I think it's something we have to come back to. I think we also have to say that while the direction in which we've been traveling is right, in some respects we just went too fast. And I think that is absolutely the lesson of the story of mass migration and free movement of people. And therefore, we have to get that back under control. The 
slogan of Brexit was take back control. Uh, in theory, you might say that a liberal society should be open to everyone. In practice, that would be the beginning of the end of any liberal democracy, an absolute opening. It is a precondition of a liberal democracy that it actually controls the flow of people uh, and indeed of goods and services across its border. We did a study at Oxford looking at the integration of immigrants in five leading Western democracies, United States, Canada, France, Germany, and Britain. Guess who came out top? Canada. Well done. Got it in one. Canada, of course, came out top. But that's not, that's not just because it's nice Canada and liberal multiculturalism and an immigrant society. Because what we discovered was the hidden key to Canada's success is that it is the only one of these five major Western democracies that can actually control its immigration because of the blessings of geography. The United States has 30 million plus minus illegal immigrants. We don't know how many people there are in Britain. People flying across the Mediterranean into France or Spain. Um, Canada alone absolutely controls it and has a very carefully managed immigration policy. If you look at the ethnic breakdown of the Canadian population, it's very interesting. No single minority group dominates. It, it's, it's diverse within the diversity. And that makes people, the sense that it's under control, makes people comfortable with immigration. So it actually makes Canadian attitudes positive to immigration. So that Justin Trudeau can then turn around and say, unlike Donald Trump, we're taking in 30,000 people from Syria. And nobody is worried about it because they feel it's under control. So that's something else liberals have to do in the uh, European, specifically EU context. This means Schengen. So in, in Europe, in the sort of, as it were, flown with liberal optimism, we made two strategic mistakes. One was the European Monetary Union, which I'll come back to if you want me to. The other was the Schengen area, you know, the visa-free travel area, because we did something absolutely extraordinary. We opened the internal borders of the Schengen area without securing the external border. If you stop to think about that, that's a crazy thing to do. Uh, so now we have to secure the external border of the Schengen area. One last thought, and then I'll throw it open for discussion. And uh, I mentioned Orwell as the patron saint at the beginning, so let me come back to Orwell at the end. So Orwell, as you know, his great subject was language in politics. And one of our problems as liberals has been our language, that we have had a cool, technocratic, rationalist language which simply has left a lot of people cold, out, feeling excluded. A friend of mine was talking about Brexit in a, in a, in a town hall in, in, the, in Newcastle, in the north of England. And he started talking about GDP. And an old lady, who's now become proverbial as the lady in Newcastle, an old lady at the back of the hall stood up and said, Mr. Professor, Professor, you talk, you're talking about GDP. That's not my GDP you're talking about. That's your GDP. And it's an absolutely killer point that this very way of talking about things in, in terms of GDP and percentage is itself a remote liberal elitist. And of course, Trump comes perfectly into this, speaking not the language of elite technocratic reason, but the language of you know, ESPN and drinking a beer at the bar, and the language of feeling, of emotion, of passion rather than reason. Quick example, do you remember when he said Obama was not born in the United States? And Obama published his birth certificate. End of story, we might think. Not a bit of it. Donald Trump said, I love this quotation, many people feel that it wasn't a proper certificate. Right? It's not even think, it's feel. Yeah? I may think this jacket is dark red, but you feel that it's blue. And this privileging of feeling has proved extraordinarily effective. And in opinion polls, 
Um, you know, 40-45% of Americans still say they're not sure Obama was born, or still said was not born in the, in the United States. This is a real challenge, not just to politicians, but also to intellectuals, and I think to journalists, to find a language to write or speak about this thing which is more affective and therefore more effective, and therefore which actually gets into the echo chambers of the populist, right? So you can write great articles and do great broadcasts which have absolutely zero impact on this other half of our society. The real journalistic challenge, and I think John Lloyd may have talked about this a bit when, because he's a great expert on, 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 on the practice of journalism, when he was talking about journalism, how do you do this journalism in a way that actually gets into the echo chambers of, of, of the populace and who feel that um, we're not even looking at them with our, pardon my French, asses? So those are just a few thoughts. I'd really welcome to have a conversation with you about it. I think it is going to be a long struggle. I do not for a moment buy the view that we have reached peak populism in Neil Ferguson's phase and that the populist wave is over. I think it's a, it's a large historical phenomenon, which is, as I say, in many ways a reaction to a very large historical phenomenon. I think it'll be with us for some time, but we have to keep fighting. Um, and in the long run, we will certainly win because we have the better ideas. Thank you.